Okay, it's Gordon. Good evening. Uh, welcome, everyone. Our guest speaker this evening will be James L. Eines. He's a courier of North Carolina Museum of History. And uh, our fellow Rotarian, Byron McCaster, will be introducing him this evening. So now it's you, Byron. Yeah, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Earl Ons. Uh, when I first saw his uh, bio, I figured I had to pick out a few pieces to uh, introduce him. A man that has done quite a bit and continues to do so much. He is currently the curator, uh, a curator at the North Carolina Museum of History, uh, a graduate of North Carolina State University with a history degree, minor in economics. Um, prior to his work as curator at the North Carolina Museum of History, uh, worked as a reference archivist um, with the North Carolina Office of Archives and History, a photograph archivist for the North Carolina Office of Archives and History, currently is a farmer uh, starting in 1993 uh, to now and also 1994 uh, owner and manager of town and country books and coffee in Wendell, North Carolina. Uh, a man who definitely is multitasking through life. Um, as far as some of his uh, civic engagement and work on boards and commissions, uh, 1994 to 1998 president of the East Wake Kiwanis Club um, 96, the chairman of the Economic Development uh, Wendell Chamber of Commerce. Um, 1997, Wake County Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, currently sits on the board of uh, Preservation North Carolina, also the advisory board for UNC TV, and uh, presently on the Black Farmers Cooperative as a member. Um, and a board member on the Africa to Carolina Commission. Uh, so a man who is doing quite a bit and on top of all that has found time to be a coach for Wendell Parks and Recreation Youth Basketball. So uh, if you ever feel like you're doing way too much in life, look at uh, Mr. Ahn's bio and, and you realize you can probably do more. Uh, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Earl L. Ahn's. Thank you, uh, Mr. McAllister, um, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it, it just about made me blush. Um, and uh, thank you, Ms. Wallace, uh, for your kind invitation to come and participate uh, uh, with the Johnston County uh, Rotary Club and, and uh, be part of your Black History Month 2021 celebrations and commemorations. And uh, I uh, just want to also thank you again for following up on our conversation from Juneteenth of 2018 when uh, we had the opportunity to meet uh, in Johnston County as part of the dedication for uh, the Freedman School here in Johnston County, which is, uh, to my count, one of the few uh, in the state and the South. So uh, that's a, a big pat on the back for what we're doing in, in Johnston County, um, North Carolina. So thank you again for uh, inviting me. And uh, I, I have one of my favorite presentations I'd like to share uh, this evening. As um, uh, Mr. McAllister indicated, I'm a farmer. And uh, one of the things I farm here uh, on my farm in Johnston County is helping to cultivate and restore uh, our once native lonely pine forest, uh, which of course is, is the state tree of North Carolina. And, um, and also I teach about it as we'll learn about as part of this presentation uh, and also work to conserve and uh, replant and, and commercial and residential uh, landscapes, and so as uh, Mr. McAllister indicated in, in the uh, in his uh, uh, generous introduction, uh, we do that through our bookstore and education foundation uh, called Town and Country Books and Education Services. Uh, you can find that online at www. 
dot t c b e s dot com and that's uh town and country books education service dot com so thank you again and uh without further ado i like to use the program and the title of a presentation that uh i've put together over a number of years documenting some of my efforts and 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 our larger efforts uh, to educate people on one hand on conservation, but also as a historian, I like to also educate people with primary sources of artifacts, documents and photographs uh, to uh, lend itself to teach our history on, on what a real Tar Heel is. So uh, the title of our presentation uh, this evening is Naval Stores and the Real Tar Heels. And it's a story about the Lonely Pines uh, by me again. My name is Earl L. Imes. And, and by the way, I, I am a seventh generation North Carolinian. Uh, and uh, my Imes last name uh, dates back to the 1700s where the first Imes uh, came uh, to North Carolina as a direct result of a Revolutionary War grant uh, where uh, my Imes last name is from the French West Indies. Uh, but that's another history lesson altogether. We'll circle back and, and again, uh, thank you for joining uh, me for Naval Stores and the Real Tar Heels. So uh, thank you, Mr. McAllister. Now Carolina, or what we call Carolina today was actually chartered in 1663 by England and named by King Charles III in honor of his father, King Carolus II. And, and that charter was the Mets and bounds between the Virginia line or the land from Virginia that was chartered by the Virginia Company of London in 1607, southward to 31 degrees latitude, present day Alabama and Florida line. And that will be claimed uh, from the Spanish and renamed Carolina in 1663. The Carolina Charter extended westward from the Pacific Ocean, basically present day North and South Georgia westward to the, to the Pacific Ocean to also include present day Southern California. And as part of that range, 93 million acres of original virgin longleaf pine forest extended from the Carolina, Georgia piney woods to what we call the pines of East Texas or basically the arc that runs from present day Dallas, Texas to San Antonio, Texas, and then back toward the Gulf Coast uh, in Texas is what originally is called the Piney Woods of East Texas. But that range of forest is the second most biodiverse ecosystem on earth after the rainforest. And consider that for a moment. The second most biodiverse ecosystem on earth after the rainforests, whether they be in Southeast Asia, our nearest rainforests are in Central America, South Florida, and of course the Amazon here. But outside of that, uh, the Lonely Pine Forest is the second most biodiverse uh, bio ecosystem on earth. So you see a photograph of me uh, in this slide, um, hugging a 450 year old a lonely pine tree located in Moore County, North Carolina. And that tree uh, has been bored and compared to others. And as it stands, it is the oldest known lonely pine tree on earth at 450 years and counting. So, uh, so the English parliament passed the Naval Stores Act of 1705 offering bounties on naval stores and encouraging Virginia's and colonists from places like Barbados and also Jamaica, which were also English colonies, uh, to settle in this vast lonely pine forest. 
Now, the bounties paid for naval stores were quite substantial. Uh, we're talking in the range of six pounds of gold per ton on hemp, uh, four pounds of gold per ton on tar and pitch, three pounds per ton on turpentine and rosin, and one pound of gold per per ton for masts, yards, and bow sprints. Now, all these items uh, comprise what are uh, what we uh, used to call the naval store industry, naval stores industry. And uh, just to recap, uh, hemp today is is not legal unless you get a license from the state. But it was readily grown and cultivated uh, first by indigenous people in Carolina. Uh, and later by the English. Uh, and it was primarily used for masts and rigging for sails and ropes for building ships, which uh, uh, the strength of hemp fiber is nearly indestructible. And so tar and pitch is also used in the naval stores industry. Uh, tar uh, is, is used as a waterproofing agent and so is pitch. Uh, tar is also used as a flammable liquid for lighting. Uh, turpentine is the number one medicinal product in the world before 1900. And if anyone who is an old timer or even does uh, old time remedies, uh, you can't use any uh, herbal or holistic remedy uh, nearly before 1900 without the use of turpentine. And I like to tell people, uh, when I was a young boy growing up in Winston-Salem, I had a great grandmother uh, who was uh, what we call Geechee or from down in the low country of South Carolina. And uh, they would use turpentine for nearly everything. But one of the remedies uh, was every year before uh, school ended and you would take your shoes off the uh, turpentine and sugar would be applied to your navel with a cotton ball. And that was a remedy to keep uh, worms from getting in your feet when you ran barefoot in the country or in the city. Uh, so these items are naval stores. And it's one of the primary reasons that the British colonized Carolina uh, was to uh, increase the uh, capability for producing uh, wooden ships. So redeeming the bounty though was risky business. So part of that risky business entailed uh, the Tuscarora Nation, which was the largest and most powerful Indian tribe, uh, not only in Carolina, but east of the Mississippi River. And uh, a lot of scholarship is coming about now. I'm currently working with the state legislature on a bill that may go toward recognizing the Tuscarora Nation, uh, indigenous people who were originally in North Carolina, but now are uh, or have been relocated uh, to New York, uh, which is another history lesson. But it came as a direct result of the Tuscarora Wars that the English fought between 1710 and 1713, uh, among other things, to remove the Tuscarora from Eastern North Carolina primarily so that they could barely ac access uh, the lonely pine groves, uh, which as far as they extended as far as the eye could see uh, at that point. And they were called lonely pine savannas. Uh, the town of Savannah, Georgia, is named for that. And there's several places throughout Eastern North Carolina uh, that are uh, called Savannahs. But simultaneously what's going on at this time in Carolina is that that notorious pirate called Blackbeard, uh, I think we've all heard of him. He was bribing the governor of North Carolina, a man named Charles Eden, so that he could retire here in Carolina. And it was just call it causing all types of calamity for the crown in England. And, and for lack of a better word, uh, the crown in England could hardly control the activities uh, of the nouveau rich crowd that was coming in the colony of Carolina. 
So uh, these events, along with general taxation, uh, led to a hasty split of Carolina along that un unnatural boundary line that extends, uh, if you know uh, your geography here in North and South Carolina, there is a line that uh, goes about 45 degrees halfway between Wilmington, North Carolina and Myrtle Beach, which is uh, presently the state line of North and South Carolina. And it was hastily drawn in an effort to split the colony and allow the crown in England to better colonize and maintain control uh, of the riches that were uh, arriving and, and, and deriving from Carolina at that time. And so believe it or not, uh, Mr. McAllister indicated my, my tenure at the state archives. I had the opportunity to serve 18 years at the state archives as an archivist. And as one of my uh, research tasks, I was able to assist the U.S. Geodetic Survey for many years, looking at old maps and, and uh, land grants and things to finally settle the line between North and South Carolina, which believe it or not, was not settled by the United States Geodetic Survey until the year 2016. So after the Naval Stores bounties were redeemed, uh, the lone leaf trees were usually harvested for timber and the forests were cleared for uh, the first burly tobacco plantations, which were located along the Virginia border in North Carolina, roughly from about present day Stokes County, which is just north of my hometown in Winston-Salem and expanding eastward toward the Roanoke River uh, in present day uh, Northampton County. And that area is what used to be called, or even still is the old border belt tobacco belt. And that was the first part of the Lonely Pine Forest that was actually clear cut and planted in some of the first crops for plantation style, uh, which in this case, was burly tobacco and burly tobacco planters who were coming down from Virginia and the Virginia Company of London to redeem bounties and extend uh, tobacco plantations and also slavery, English colonial slavery into uh, Carolina. So uh, what you see here is uh, where uh, the trees that were harvested many years, uh, there's a line of trees that was saved in this photograph. And if you look very closely to the middle of the photograph, you can see a man named John L. Roper standing next to the tree. He is literally dwarfed by this giant uh, lonely pine tree that is uh, nearly 100 feet tall. But if you can imagine, these are the types of trees in the forest that literally coated all of North Carolina up to the mountains and west all the way to Texas. And Johnston County, or what's now present day Johnston County, North Carolina, uh, which was chartered in 1746 by the Crown in England, was originally covered with lonely pine pocosins that looked not unlike this photograph. So within 10 years of the 1705 Lonely Pine Bounty, uh, three port towns have been established by the British. Bath, North Carolina, which is the oldest town in North Carolina, was chartered a year after the Naval Stores Act in 1706 uh, is when Bath, North Carolina was chartered. New Bern, North Carolina is the second oldest town in North Carolina chartered in 1710 on the mouth of the Noose River. So back up, uh, Bath is located on the mouth of the Tar Pamlico River and the uh, uh, Albemarle Sound. And of course, easily accessible to go back out to sea for the British and to return uh, in the transatlantic slave trade uh, from North Carolina and or Virginia and, and to go back uh, to England. 
Edenton is the third oldest town in North Carolina, and it was chartered in 1712 uh, on the Chowan River uh, in northeastern North Carolina. And Beaufort uh, is the next oldest town. In 1715, it's chartered on the mouth of uh, the Tar River uh, down uh, in, in present day uh, Washington County, North Carolina. So Bath and Beaufort were also ports of entry or customs district, British customs ports. And these towns were doing very brisk business and they could not, uh, or enslaved laborers usually were doing most of the work at this time, could not prepare the bounties fast enough for them to be redeemed. So complaints started to be drawn by the crown for poorly prepared residence products that were being so hastily prepared and redeemed that they would have things like pine straw in the tar or pine cone dust uh, in some of the pitch, uh, which of course uh, would, would lessen the grade of the product. So because of these and also all of the political, geopolitical dynamics that were going on in Carolina during the transatlantic slave trade, uh, the British revoked the bounty to, to, to better able to control the colony of Carolina until they could uh, uh, reissue the bounties uh, uh, in, in, in the few years after 1725. So when North Carolina became a royal colony finally in 1729, when the split between North and South Carolina was finally official. Uh, both North and South Carolina were deemed royal colonies uh, by parliament and the British restored those bounties at one pound of gold per ton on pitch, two pounds and four shillings per ton on tar and pitch. So the English also ramped up uh, the slave trade to specify uh, what were termed guinea people or Guinea men in particular uh, from Africa or from the part of Africa uh, that we call uh, the Gambia today that is located at the mouth uh, of the Niger River or Cape Verde uh, on the western coast of Africa is where some of the first people from Africa were brought to uh, these shores and enslaved uh, to be essentially the first Tar Heels. So uh, when, and I like to take this opportunity as a genealogist to remind people who uh, may be on the call or watching this virtually that when you're doing your genealogy in African American history and you see that term Guinea, it refers to a specific part of Africa presently called the Gambia, it used to be called the Guinea coast but these are a tribe of people who come from a rainforest area of low country that is not unlike Eastern North Carolina and the low country of South Carolina and Georgia. And that's largely why the science of the English slave trade and the African chiefdoms on the continent of Africa identified those people in particular uh, to be enslaved and brought to the new world uh, is to work in those uh, similar uh, conditions. And so the English ramp up the slave trade uh, to specify these Guinea men from Africa to Carolina, uh, specifically for the purpose of naval store production. And in this image, an unidentified African-American man is carrying a dipper and a reservoir uh, in Carolina and this photograph is from about 1880 uh, that I located in the state archives uh, in Raleigh. So the reduced bounties of 1729 also signaled a geographic shift in naval stores productions from the previously mentioned Albemarle region of Northeastern North Carolina. And if you could look at a map, you'll see this is the part of North Carolina where the Virginians first began to trickle into the Carolina colony uh, and began to actually uh, uh, 
implement the naval stores industry for the first time. But what happens is the trees, as I mentioned, they clear and began to uh, build uh, burly tobacco plantations. Uh, and so as the forests are cleared, the industry crosses the Tar River and the Noose River where Smithfield is located. Uh, and then goes into the Cape Fear River basins where two new uh, seaports are established by the British, a place called Brunswick Town uh, that is down in, in present day Brunswick County. And uh, if I may take a moment to, uh, to give uh, prayers and condolence for that community, I think we all saw where a uh, tremendous tornado hit Brunswick County uh, overnight, uh, February the 15th, uh, and unfortunately resulted in fatalities. But this is the same Brunswick County where Brunswick Town was founded in 1725. And then of course, we all know of Wilmington, North Carolina, and Wilmington was also chartered by the British as a, a customs port in 1739. So the Cape Fear region also marked a shift in demographics because what happens is uh, South Carolinians or people who are then after 1729 referred to as South Carolinians and colonists from Barbados and uh, Jamaica, uh, I omitted from this slide, uh, with more Africans and more strict slave codes began to pour into the new colony of North Carolina. And by the 1750s, the Cape Fear region enumerated about half of the population of the entire colony of North Carolina and of the entire population of uh, 124,000 people uh, in counted or enumerated by the British in the 1750s, a solid one third of that humanity had been imported from the shores of Africa and enslaved here in America. So this is a map that shows those customs ports and to get an idea or a visual of those river basins that I previously mentioned. And this is an image from the time of Governor Tryon in 1768, uh, who uh, I like to term as the primary instigator uh, of the American Revolution. Uh, but that is uh, another history lesson uh, for us. But again, this is a map that shows and visualizes those custom ports and those river basins that I previously mentioned uh, uh, from north to south or more indicative from northeast to southwest. You'll see Edenton uh, in the northeast located on the Chowan River. Uh, and then if you come down, there's Bath uh, located on the Tar Pamlico uh, River uh, there. And if you continue to come down, there's New Bern, which is just down the New River again from Smithfield. And by the way, the Noose River was once navigable from Smithfield all the way to the coast. Uh, that's why uh, it got its name as a Smithfield. It was a field or a Pocosin uh, with, uh, where the Noose River uh, was relatively shallow, but still navigable all the way to the coast. But unfortunately, with the removal and destruction of the Lonely Pine Forest, uh, hardwood trees have uh, invaded all around Johnston County into that uh, natural pine ecosystem and has since choked uh, the Noose River and it is no longer navigable from Smithfield down to the coast. Uh, and if you continue down uh, into uh, southwestward toward Wilmington and Brunswick Town, of course, you'll see. Uh, the Cape Fear uh, River Basin, which is uh, the longest river basin in North Carolina proper. However, it is not the longest river basin in Carolina. Uh, that distinguished uh, honor goes to the Yadkin PD River Basin that again flows from my hometown in Winston-Salem uh, all the way to Georgetown, South Carolina. Uh, next slide, please. So this shows a steamer on the Cape Fear River about 1900 uh, and uh, uh, with barrels of crude uh, headed for the port at Wilmington. 
and uh, which uh, at that time was the state's largest city. Now from 1705 Naval Store Act to the fiery end of the Civil War in 1865, North Carolina led the entire world in the production of naval stores. And again, that's the production of turpentine, pitch, rosin, and tar. Now, I wanna uh, uh, put this in terms of economics because uh, Mr. McAllister mentioned in the introduction uh, uh, my background in economics. And so <clears throat> one thing I like to do is talk about if I can just allude to the bounties that were originally placed on naval stores for the six pounds per gold per ton. Now, if you think in terms of a ton, a ton was about a barrel or sometimes referred to by the old time as a hog's head, which is uh, equivalent to uh, six pounds of gold per ton. To place this into context in 1705, one would need to serve no less than five consecutive years in his majesty's army as a private in order to earn six pounds of gold. So that gives you an idea of the land rush or the gold rush in terms of economics that Carolina presented for the crown in England and the problem to the crown that I previously mentioned with the vast and the fast accumulation of wealth and not being able to control nor tax it. So from 1705 until the end of the Civil War in 1865, uh, the state colony of North Carolina led the world in naval stores production. So you might say, well, Earl Imes, tell us more about the significance of that. Well, that's a great question because wooden boats were the primary mode for the largest migration in human history from the old world to the new world. Now, I previously mentioned, and, and I think we all know and hopefully can begin to garner some appreciation uh, for the millions of people who were brought from Africa to the new world. And every single one of those people were brought over here on wooden boats. And all of those wooden boats, whether they be from Africa or whether they be from Europe, colonists from Scotland, from England, from France, they all came to the New World in boats. And between 1705 and 1865, there are some years upwards of 90% of the pit that is used to waterproof all the boats coming to the New World is coming from the ports and Wilmington and Beaufort and New Bern and Bath and Edenton. Now let that sink in for a moment. This is at a time before there was a cotton boom, before tobacco was king in North Carolina, before there was rice ever planted, before there was sweet potatoes, I believe it leads the country in sweet potato production as well. But none of those commodities could be planted in a pine forest. And the pine forest was harvested first for naval stores. And that is what created the wealth and the investment for these commodities that later become staples uh, in the, uh, econ in the uh, slave trade and the slave economy. So if I could say kind of a crude joke, that would be a real pitch for the economic origins of the American South. Thank you. Don't laugh too hard, please. Uh, this is a receipt uh, for a boat that is about to leave the port at Beaufort. And I'm gonna read it. Uh, it says Customs House. <clears throat> I'm sorry, yes, yes, thank you, Customs House. These are to certify that the sloop William Warner and the master and the Nancy from the port in Beaufort, North Carolina is carrying 101 barrels of tar. 
Now, let's just take that 101 barrels in tar and go back to the mathematics that we mentioned before. In 1729, those bounties had been reduced to three pounds per gold per barrel. So if we multiply those three pounds by this 101, someone's gonna get somewhere in the range of about 303 pounds of gold for that one for that one shipment of those 101 barrels of tar. That's a lot of money, ladies and gentlemen. 98 barrels of turpentine, seven barrels of pitch, five barrels of wax and tallow, 67 sides of leather. The fur trade was very lucrative as well. 69 hides, 26 bundles of deer thins, four cakes of wax and tallow, For the <clears throat> for whereof in this port the bond was given in Beaufort, aforesaid, given under my hand and the seal and the office on this 21st day of February, 1761. So we're almost 100, I'm sorry, 260 days, 260 years to the day, at least to the month of this actual receipt uh, at this customs house. Uh, but this gives an idea of the wealth that is coming from Carolina and is going overseas as part of the transatlantic slave trade. And again, ladies and gentlemen, this is before cotton is planted in North Carolina. And this is right as tobacco is being planted and bright leaf tobacco, I mind you, uh, was not discovered until 1837. And it was actually discovered and perfected by an enslaved farmer in Caswell County named Stephen Slade. Uh, and so again, Brightleaf Boulevard in Smithfield, there was no Brightleaf tobacco to be spoken of at that time. So again, let's just think about the wealth that it generates and how it led to the investment uh, that we are still uh, reaping benefits from uh, today. So the economic appeal of naval stores also complemented uh, the crop cycle and induced the emerging slave trade. Now tar, though it's produced in the summer, is usually marketed in the winter after the harvest. It was also cheap to produce tar because the raw materials were boxed or dead and or dying pine trees that had already been hacked for turpentine beginning in the spring of that year. So I'm gonna start right there for a moment and, uh, and kind of digest that. So the tree, once a tree is hacked, and if we ever have the opportunity to do this in person, I have artifacts that can demonstrate, but a boshing act would literally uh, induce a three to four foot gash into a pine, a lonely pine tree, uh, literally between the bark of the tree. And a turpentine hack would be you to rip that bark and essentially a V so that it opens a wound in the tree and the tree begins to bleed sap. And the sap is then scraped with a turpentine scraper into a reservoir where it is carried off and distilled. Now, uh, two things are going on with this. Uh, number one, there's a science because uh, the sap of the lonely pine tree, slaveholders and the slave economy wanted to maximize as much sap that could be literally drained from a lonely pine tree. And so that process literally begins on the spring equinox or for you farmers, for you folks who are not farmers out there, the equinox is the first day of spring or the day, uh, March 20th, when the daylight and the night is evenly 12 hours apiece. And on that day is when the sap and the pine trees begin to flow up in the tree. And that is literally when slaveholders would have 
their turpentine gangs working in turpentine orchards or pine tree forests, in other words, and began hacking that first hack uh, for the first uh, sap to be distilled into turpentine. And what that also causes is the tree to stress. And if I can uh, 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 point you to anyone who has seen uh, sap running from a pine tree, over time it stresses the tree and the tree's limbs begin to fall off on the forest floor or on your driveway in modern terms. And those uh, laps or what they're called are scraped up and they will later be collected later in the year and into a mound and burn into what the old timers would call a tar kiln mound, T-A-R-K-I-L-N. Uh, you may have heard it in Johnston County old timers as a tarco mound. Uh, but if you've ever heard that terminology, that is what it is referring to. It was cheap. Uh, to produce tar because the raw materials were boxed dead or dying trees from the limbs that were being that were falling from the tree and being scraped up and and burned in tar kill mounds into tar. So by the time the sap stopped flowing in autumn, so this process would literally go through for the entire spring and summer until the end of summer on the fall equinox, again when the days and the nights are equal 12 hours per day and the sap stops flowing, then that's when usually young boys were employed, well, maybe that's not the right word, were enslaved uh, to pick up these laps and rake up these taco mounds so that uh, uh, men who were enslaved and boys who were enslaved could begin the arduous process of sweating tar or producing tar. So the profits, so by the time the sap stopped, by the time the sap stopped flowing in the autumn, these real tar hills will begin building the tar hills for the winter. And the profits were substantial and the slaveholder had little investment beyond the people themselves because unlike plantation slavery, these men and boys were enslaved in turpentine orchards where they would live in camps and would have to live off the land themselves in order to survive. And, uh, and in many instances were given the, um, in many instances they were given the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the idea of uh, little or nothing beyond uh, what the slaveholder had actually paid in terms of money. So investors call uh, turpentine factors usually lease the land, uh, sometimes called turpentine orchards uh, from absentee landowners. So this photograph shows uh, a tar pit by the 18 and the men in the pits were derided as tar babies, which was also another pejorative term like that term that was reserved for people who hacked the trees that were called tar hills. Next slide, please. So by the time of the Revolutionary War, as I mentioned, the colony was a one third enslaved. And so a French traveler came here and he said that one man can easily box 3,000 trees or two to four boxes per tree. And that number is generally signed one Negro. The Negro is doing most of the work. And in rainy weather, the outflow is less, but it is reckoned that 3,000 boxes or more than 120 barrels should be obtained in one summer. So again, you can do the math, multiply the number of barrels by the number of pounds per gold, and you can see what the slaveholders would have derived. About 54 enslaved men would have tended a typical 640 acre land grant or a square mile 
or longleaf pines, depending on the density of the forest. And this photo shows unidentified man hacking a lonely pine tree again, about 1880. Next slide, please. So with westward expansion across the South, many slaveholders migrated with a human chattel outside of North Carolina, across that 93 million acre span of virgin lonely pines, which again stretch all the way to Texas. And so, uh, so between, uh, the do uh, as people immigrated westward. Now, due to our struggling economy and difference to education in our state at that time, before 1850, and resistant taxation for any reason, uh, most of our lonely pines disappeared before 1850. And so, this was the largest industry in our state, and it caused it a large out migration. And so at this time, our state was called the Rip Van Winkle State because if turpentining wasn't going on, it was commonly said that people were sleeping. Next frame. So while the Eastern part of the state struggled economically and suffered from outward migration, uh, the back country slumbered and the Piedmont counties basically from about Hillsboro, North Carolina in the North and West, Southwest to Anson County, uh, uh, which is where Waysboro on the south is, uh, there was an economic malaise because the rivers had begun ch had gotten choked up and they were not navigable. So we needed uh, some improvements in order to keep people in the state and increase our economy. But if you look in this background, it shows a 1900 photograph in Eastern North Carolina after the forest had been completely cut. And so if you can imagine the trees that have grown back since that time are mostly oak trees and have changed the forest and the ecosystem altogether, so much so that the capital of the Pine State today is known as the City of Oaks. Next. Uh, so in 1833, state leaders wanted to stimulate the economy of the Wilt Van Rico State with a series of internal improvements like waterways. Uh, next frame. Uh, building railroads, and you can see where they're harvesting naval stores in the bottom there. The North Carolina Railroad is one of those railroads that was built. It comes straight through Smithfield back to Goldsboro, then to Wilmington, and from Smithfield back to Raleigh, Hillsboro, Greensboro, then to Charlotte. It was constructed by enslaved men between 1847 and 1855. Uh, next frame, please and plank roads like this one. And you can see turpentine barrels being transported over the plank road bridge there about 1890. Next frame, please. So one of the internal improvements uh, uh, approved by the North Carolina General Assembly was 129 plank, 129 mile plank road from Fayetteville, North Carolina to Bethania, which is uh, a Moravian village that's now located inside Winston-Salem. And you can see a photograph here of uh, massive numbers of Tar Heels who toiled in the pine forest harvesting naval stores while they simultaneously built the Fayetteville and Western Plank Road, which was the longest plank road on earth when it was completed construction in 1855. Uh, next frame, please. And this is a receipt uh, for a toll, uh, for a, um, a pass on the Fayetteville and Western Plank Road or a, or a toll to go on the Fayetteville and Western Plank Road uh, from 1857. Uh, next frame, please. So internal improvements like the Wilmington and, well Road, Wilmington and Raleigh Railroad open routes uh, through the last virgin timber lonely pine forest. And so the Wilmington and Raleigh Railroad, which began from the Virginia border, was the longest railroad on earth when it was completed. It originally started as the Wel Wilmington and Weldon Railroad uh, in 1839, and it spanned 140 miles from the Virginia border to the port of Wilmington, and it, will, and it was completed by uh, enslaved laborers in 1840, was the longest railroad on earth. And you'll see on the right side of the uh, screen a 
uh, newspaper article that I located from the North Carolina Star in October 1839, which talks about the trade uh, at Wilmington. And it says the commercial prospects seem to have already received a great boost uh, from the completion of the railroad and the Chronicle states that among the most recent results which have flowed from the establishment of the Wilmington and Raleigh Railroad, several barrels of spirits of turpentine have been carried on the new railroad to Wilmington, which has been manufactured at Smithfield in Johnston County. And there has heretofore been but little commercial intercourse between Smithfield and 100 miles south to the port at Wilmington before that uh, railroad was completed. So that explains, next frame please, uh, why we still have quite a number of lonely pines uh, compared to other places in North Carolina in Eastern North Carolina in particular in Johnston County is because we were some of the last to access. So uh, Bentonville, North Carolina was the last major civil war battle in North Carolina and was fought, of course, here in Johnston County. But few people know that it was fought uh, on what was originally John W. Hood's Turpentine Distillery, which was the largest employer in the Johnston County, Sampson County area, where it's located near present day Mount Olive. So the Confederate Army, uh, Plitt and General Sherman's Union Army came through and smashed the remnants of it uh, to create, to finish the, the destruction of both the Naval Stores industry in Johnston County, as well as the end of the Civil War. And I do a presentation annually called Gone with the Wind uh, at Historic Bennett Place that talks more about this. Next screen, screen, please. So after the Civil War, Naval Stores futures tank as the bright leaf tobacco economy emerged and so uh, this is a 1904 naval scene that shows the turpentine still and workers on the shanty uh, where uh, this image later became the tract of land that we now call Southern Pines, North Carolina, which was purchased by the Boyd family as a direct result of them seeing some of the last Tar Heels in 1904 and 05, hacking the pine trees in Moore County and Southern Pines. And that's why today Southern Pines and, and Pinehurst still has quite a few of their lonely pines because they were among the last uh, to be accessed for naval stores. Uh, next frame, please. So this is the back of the postcard for genealogical and research purposes, uh, if anybody ever does that type of research. Uh, next frame, please. So most, known, most lonely pines are now located in residential communities and small landholders like those lots that I've seen in town in Smithfield. There's several town, uh, several homes in town with lonely pines that date before the Civil War. And this is an image of one in Wilmington uh, on a home that was built in 1965 from a tree that was likely hacked a hundred years before that home was built. Next uh, frame, please. So enslaved Tar Heels probably hacked a 300 year old lonely pine in Columbus County. And I point to the wound in the reservoir of the cavity. And this is located on highway 701. And we took this photograph. My, my kids were, I should say, were thrilled to take this photograph, pull over and, and uh, take this image uh, in 2012. Thank you. Next frame, please. And Mr. Hyde, how many more we got? Cause we going over. Yeah, we're, we're uh, wrapping up about two minutes. Okay, thank you. These tar disappeared on the Tar River and Rocky Mount, and you can see this tree is now gone and there are no more lonely pine trees, no more tar trees on the Tar River and Tarboro. Next frame, please. So uh, as I mentioned, various hardwood species uh, invade the lonely pine forest and they literally take over. And as an example, this is a photograph of found in, Har in Harney County which is right next door to Johnston County to the west. 100 years ago, they harvested 100 feet tall trees out of there. And if you look closely in, in the background, they're originally palm trees that were also growing in the forest here before they also became 
uh, nearly extinct. Next frame. So the Lonely Pine Forest I mentioned was originally 93 million acres spanning from North Carolina to Texas, but today less than 1 million of those acres of the 93 million survive. The largest single track is located in Southern Pines in Weymouth Woods, 613 acres. And I'm in that forest now uh, holding a photograph, I mean, holding a Lonely Pine Cone and, and help, helping people understand the, ne the necessity to conserve our forest and our ecosystem. Uh, next frame, please. So the former pitch pine forest here, you can see, uh, this is what normally, if you go out today, what the pine forest looks like. And this is the direct reason, if you look closely, there are no baby pine trees. And over time, those large pine trees will die. And eventually we will lose our lonely pine forest unless we uh, take action. Next frame, please. And this is a direct result of what happens when lonely pines are overtaken by hardwood trees without a controlled burn. Next frame, please. And so this uh, is the, the last frame where I point to the skeleton of a 300 year old pine tree, uh, which was uh, cut down to make room for a parking lot. And so before I left, I had to deploy the site managers to replant lonely pines and help with stormwater drainage and restoring our ecosystem and our planet. Next frame, please. So thank you. Here's to the land of the lonely pine, the summer land where the sun where the wheat grows strong and the strong grow great. Here's the life in the old North state. Essequan with dairy. Thank you very much. Okay, I want to thank you. Uh, I know it had to go through real fast, uh, the time there. So, uh, uh, Brenda, could you read our question? Maybe we'll do about, about five minutes of questions. If there's there any? Rhonda? Uh, I, yeah, I don't see any in the chat. Oh, you don't see any? Okay, then. Anyone I do have a question uh, real quick, Mr. Himes. Uh, can you speak to the political climate in North Carolina that kind of allowed the uh, Rip, Rip Van Winkle stage or period to, to occur? Uh, because you would think that, you know, eventually some type of uproar or desire for a little progress in the state would uh, encourage the uh, political powers to take some action to improve. Well, that is a good question. And thank you. I didn't have time to go over that in that particular frame, but um, around 1833, uh, people began to notice that they uh, were not being able to access Lonely Pines or get them to one of those ports. And so what was happening is people were literally moving west and harvesting pines and they would end up in Georgia or Alabama and become part of those economies. So uh, the internal improvements acts were instigated by the state legislature, in particular, a man named Nathaniel Macon, um, who was from Warren County, the town of Macon is named for him, and Macon County out in the mountains, because uh, he is noted as the father of internal improvements for instigating uh, these internal, uh, 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 those plank roads that emanate from Fayetteville, from the market house in particular, those uh, uh, 301s that go through Smithfield, the 401s, the 501s, the 601s, the 701s, those are all plank roads that were part of the internal improvements to emanate from Fayetteville uh, starting in the 1830s. And then you have uh, the intercoastal waterway uh, that people enjoy now. Those are literally dug by enslaved laborers uh, to allow for better access for uh, bateau and and for um, uh, float uh, for uh, steamship and navig navig navigability between plantations and rivers and tributaries. And then uh, lastly, I mentioned the, uh, uh, the building of the railroads where North Carolina literally led the world in railroad construction and uh, sophistication. As I mentioned, had, we had the longest railroad in earth when it was completed in 1840. Uh, between Wilmington and Weldon. And then we had the most sophisticated railroad 
on earth, the North Carolina Railroad, that actually resulted in the founding of Goldsboro, North Carolina, uh, and uh, and and other places like Burlington, uh, along the railroad line, Selma as well, along that rail, uh, railroad line. So yeah, that was a great question because that was a way that those corridors today literally make up Interstate 85 and 95 today and serve that very same purpose to connect the economy and the regions of North Carolina across those river basins. Very cool, thank you. Okay, yeah, in, the essence, in the essence of time, I won't do any more questions, but I wanna thank you. This was a wealth of knowledge, I'm sure for a lot of us here this evening. And uh, uh, I just wanna uh, correct, uh, this is the Rotary Club of 7710, not Johnston County. Because okay. we are from uh, all over. We have someone from India, Durham, Raleigh, uh, it's the Smithfield, uh, Apex, and help me, Selma. So we are, uh, that's why we are the Rotary E Club, because we are from all over. And we have one, uh, MG is from India. Oh, okay, very and Clayton, good. So we are from all over. So that's why we are the E Club. Very good. Well, thank you. Thank you for. Uh... For let me know. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to uh, unshare the screen here. Byron, can you do that, please? It's not sharing anymore. Oh, it's not sharing anymore. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm trying to share it so I can give them the thank you card. Thank you. Why isn't it coming there? Oh, here. It is. I think this is it. Well, it, Byron, I would I would get it to you, uh, uh, Miss Ein. It's the thank you card from the Rotary Club. I'm trying to pull it up to see where is it. Okay. Well, I, I will get it to you. Um, I will I will I will send you the thank you because I can't pull it up now. Okay. Okay. So I like to say thank well, you. Well, thank to, you. Okay. Thank you to our visitors. And we would love for you to come back again. If you would like to have a copy of our newsletter and upcoming events, please visit our Facebook or you can inbox it, put it in the chat, and then uh, Rhonda will uh, get your email address so that way she can send it to you as well. So if you're interested in receiving our um, <coughs> uh, newsletter, you can do that uh, by getting that from Rhonda. And I wanna thank everyone for coming in here tonight. We had, I think 21 people, so that is really good. I'm really sorry that I can't pull up that thank you because uh, I'm working for my cell phone as well. Uh, MG will be giving us the four-way test tonight. I think he had to go. Oh, he did? Yeah. Is he gone? I think so. I don't see him. Okay, well, let me pull it up. Can we all do it, the four-way test then? Sure. Let's stop sharing. Here we go. Okay, Kathy, can you do the four-way test for me, please? I, I would love to, Doris, thank you. Okay, um, I appreciate it. The four-way test of the things we think, say, or do. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? And again, I want to thank all of you for coming with us tonight. And so this would be the end of our meeting tonight. And I'd ask all of you to stay safe, stay well, and stay warm. And, and for our friends back in Texas and other states, uh, that they get some electricity in so that way they will be warm. Because I'm hearing that... Uh, some families didn't even have any blanket enough for their kids. They they just freezing uh, with the small kids because they weren't prepared uh, with the electricity out. Also concerned about the people in Brunswick County, I believe the tornado. Oh, okay. The group of students we were I was working with on Saturday may not around to finish the work next Saturday, so it's home for us. Okay, but then thank everyone. Good night and have a good remaining of your week and stay safe.
uh, as much as possible if you can, but yet continue to do your rotary duty. And so, um, so good night, everyone. Yes, thank you. Good night. Um, good night. Okay. Oh, did you want to say something, Rhonda? Yeah, your contact information, um, Earl. I have a forestry uh, uh, from the University of South Carolina. I would love to introduce you. <laughs> he was well, I can give you his information. It's okay. really, he needs more than 35 minutes because he does, he really needs an hour. So I will give you his information so that way you can uh, make contact with him. Is that okay? Yeah, we want to talk about the hemp industry. There's actually um, federal funds to start that up again in North Yeah, it is, yeah. So I would like Earl okay. to connect with you. Okay, yes, uh, because there's oh, a- uh, type it in here, let me see. Go yeah, ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Don't wait a minute to see if I can type it in. <clears throat> yeah, uh, pl uh, please do uh, 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 follow up because the uh, as as I showed in the uh, presentation here, uh, that was a viable uh, industry uh, once upon a time here, and it was one of the reasons the British colonized uh, this place in particular. Yeah, there's federal funds now to actually bring the industry back. So. <laughs> interested in um, getting you connected with someone who's actually in charge of making that known to landowner air they call it air landowners or something people who own land but not using it and may have also another congratulations God. possibly with lose hours, minutes. they're talking to them about having hemp oh. growing hemp hey, yeah Being number one I'll have to yeah. do Hey, well, I forward, though. Hey, okay. I'm in touch with you. <laughs> All right. Okay, good. I you. put his uh, information there. Thank you. Th yeah. His email. Okay, okay, good night, everybody, and thank you so very much. So I hope Pleasure. everyone enjoyed. And thank, thank you, you Byron. As good, to good to see everyone. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh,